Okay, we have a second concept for you to consider, and this is the uh, renewal of the Centers of Excellence in LC Research. And uh, Jean McEwen is uh, going to, she's a program director in uh, Genom Genomics and Society Division, and she's going to present on behalf of uh, Joy Boyer. Jean? Great. Thank you, Rudy. Um, so a little bit of background on the SEER program. Um, we're now in, in the 13th year of the program's existence. Uh, we've uh, issued our first set of grants back in fiscal year 2004. Um, and the goals of the program um, have really been the same since the inception of the program. Um, and they are, uh, first, to create transdisciplinary research teams that can integrate behavioral, social science, legal, and humanities research with genomic research efforts. Um, second goal is to facilitate the translation of research findings so that they can be used to inform health, research, and public policies, so a translational aim. And then the third goal is um, to really develop the next generation of LC researchers, um, with emphasis on recruiting people from diverse backgrounds. Um, in the initial years of the program, we used um, two mechanisms, the P50 full center mechanism, as well as the P20 exploratory or planning grant mechanism. Um, but when we last issued the RFA um, in uh, 2015, uh, for various um, technical and administrative reasons, uh, we switched to a different mechanism, the RM1, uh, the Research Project with Complex Structure Mechanism, um, and that's the same mechanism that we're proposing to use again um, this time around. Um, so, so far, since the program began, um, we funded a total of 11 full centers and eight of the, those P20 exploratory centers in the years when we were, were, were funding those. Um, currently, we have six of these centers funded, listed here um, at UNC Chapel Hill, um, Gail Henderson, PI, that center. Uh, we also have a center at Columbia University, a center at Johns Hopkins, uh, one at the University of Oklahoma, University of Utah, which uh, Jeff Botkin here is the PI of that center, and finally a center at uh, Vanderbilt University. So six centers, and currently our Budget for the program is about $6.1 million a year to fund these, um, these six centers, and that represents about 33% of the LC 5% set aside. Um, so that's where we're at budgetarily. So to sort of clarify where um, the, the various um, centers are currently at in, in the funding cycle, UNC is now finishing its um, first, or its, its, its actual five-year renewal, so it will not be eligible to apply uh, for this RFA. Columbia is now finishing its first funding cycle, so it will be eligible to reapply uh, for, at this time for one more uh, four-year cycle of funding. And the other four centers, um, Hopkins, um, Oklahoma, uh, Utah, and Vanderbilt, were all funded in, in 2016, so they all are fully funded for the next few years. Um, a few uh, words about the accomplishments of the centers uh, that we've seen sort of play out over the life of the program. Um, first, I, th I think it's fair to say that over the years, the centers that we funded have done a very good job of establishing productive transdisciplinary research teams that have really um, involved the integration of a broad spectrum of both um, LC research and genomic research. Um, a number of the investigators uh, currently serve as PIs or co-investigators or consultants on various of the large-scale uh, genomic studies, uh, many of them funded through our Division of Genomic Medicine, uh, such as on a number of the grants in um, eMERGE, um, in the CSER program, and in INSIGHT, uh, the newborn uh, sequencing program. And it's also, I think, worth noting that um, by working within their institutions across disciplines, there's actually been a, a fair amount of um, institutional support from these home institutions for, for this kind of transdisciplinary research that really integrates this whole spectrum of, of disciplines. Um, in terms of their translational successes, um, over the years, uh, the SEERS have provided a lot of resources, I think, to policymakers. Um, they've written policy briefs and white papers that have really been used to inform the development of legislation at both the state and federal level. Um, uh, investigators from the Sears have provided a lot of um, expert testimony to Congress, uh, to state legislatures, to groups like the President's Bioethics Commission and other federal advisory committees. 
and they served on these committees as both um, investig or, uh, as members and in some cases as chairs. And in terms of their training mission, um, this is uh, more than 100 graduate and postdoctoral students and junior faculty members um, have now over the years received training or mentoring through the SEERS. And about 25% um, of the trainees um, have been members of underrepresented minority groups, which is, I think, a pretty good record. Um, a number of the SEERS actually have offered training at the undergraduate level, um, which in many cases has been a really successful way of bringing in minority uh, trainees at the sort of the beginning of the pipeline. And um, a number of the uh, graduate students and postdocs that have been trained through the SEERS um, have gone on to get tenure track positions and a number have uh, become PIs on their own grants. So I think by and large the program has, has been fairly successful in terms of accomplishing those three basic goals. So our plans for the reissuance, um, basically the version that we're proposing this time is essentially identical to what we issued um, back in 2015 when we moved to that RM1 mechanism. Um, so specifically, once again, we'll require um, a focused and yet flexible research plan. We wanted people to propose either a, a single large project or a series of sort of highly integrated, more focused projects, kind of all focused around a single theme. Um, and we expect a good description of the education and career advancement activities that will be undertaken. Um, and unlike in the initial um, years of the program when we were really ex uh, fo focused exclusively on postdoc training, um, now under this mechanism the training activities can really span the entire pipeline. So everything um, from graduate students to junior faculty and sort of everything in between. Um, these grants once again will be uh, for four years with the possibility of a four-year renewal uh, for a total of uh, eight years of funding. And um, just as with the last time we issued the RFA, the budgets will be limited to um, $650,000 per year. Um, that's uh, direct costs. Um, the one thing we are uh, proposing in this reissuance is to provide a bit more clarification about the importance of the, um, the uh, uh, education and career advancement activities that we expect the centers to conduct. I think the last time the RFA was issued, there was um, some sort of lack of clarity in the language and there was a sense among I think some of the applicants and some of the feedback we got from reviewers that we were stepping away from that uh, component of, of the centers which was not the intention so we've tried or we will be trying to really clarify this time that that remains a, an essential um, part of, of uh, the expectations. Um, and we uh, will be encouraging people um, to Again, really keep the emphasis on, on training of minority um, or people from underrepresented minorities, um, encouraging them to leverage existing institutional programs and to take advantage of things like our um, diversity action plan and the other NIH diversity programs that exist, uh, like the administrative supplements to promote, uh, promote diversity um, and the NRSA um, pre-doctoral diversity award to re recruit and, and retain minority scholars. So um, to kind of briefly summarize our overall plan, um, we plan to open this to all applicants. Um, we do anticipate that the one center whose funding will be um, ending next year may well apply, but the competition is wide open and we do anticipate receiving applications from a number of different institutions. And we hope to be able to make available um, around or up to $2 million in funding, uh, which would allow us to fund up to two centers um, the goal would be so that we could maintain about uh, six centers in all while still keeping our budget to about 33% of our, our LC set aside. And I should mention that we're not planning um, to issue an exploratory uh, solicitation as we did in those earlier years of the program. Our sense from our experience the last time we issued the announcement was that we're now at a point where there's really um, a pretty substantial number of institutions out there who are at a, a point where they can they really have the capacity to compete uh, successfully for, for a full center application, so we don't really see the necessity anymore for an exploratory mechanism. So in terms of the proposed timeline, um, we think um, if council approves the concept that we'll be ready for a July release date uh, with um, applications due in November. 
Um, they would be reviewed then in February or March uh, of next year and then come back to council a year from now um, with the anticipation of a start date in August or September of 2018. So that's our general plan. Uh, if anyone has questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. Questions for Jean. Yeah. Shanita. Um, so thanks for a very nice overview and summary of the CSER program. I'll just say that um, I would used to be part of one, and I think it did really provide a, um, an important mechanism for increasing access to um, LC research issues among underrepresented minority groups. I had a postdoc who um, went on to become an assistant professor at Columbia University, so I count her her involvement in the CSER program as a really important um, um, component of her training. So a question for you is, you know, why the, how was the decision made to only have two applications that would be funded in this next round of, of the program? Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of as a practical matter, it's, it's really a budgetary thing, as I said, we were actually were advised by council several years ago um, not to let uh, the number of centers that are funded exceed uh, about a third of our budget. And so if we were going to have to limit it to a probably a maximum of six in order to keep to that limitation, because otherwise, you know, we don't have enough funds for investigator-initiated uh, grants. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as somebody who is sundowning on my on my center I, I have found it to be an extraordinary um, opportunity to train uh, new people to bring together groups of people at an institution or several institutions to uh, network across the country um, and uh, and the the kinds of work that that are that's done in the program that's done fostered by these centers has changed remarkably since 2003. Is that when you first 2004, the, I think. Yeah. 2004, when those were first awarded. Think about that's 12 years, and think about what's happened with genomics. And the centers have really allowed people to be nimble, I think, in response to some of these technological sort of emerging issues in ELSI that track emerging different changes in, in genomics and big, big data. And, um, I, I, I wonder, um, uh, I wanted to follow up on Chinita's question because I'm just wondering um, why not, I, I think they're very functional, um, why not um, fund three instead of two? Well, uh, unless you think council said something that you can't uh, work against. No, it's certainly always <laughs> something we can revisit, um, absolutely. Um, but it is always this question of how we balance the investigator-initiated part of the portfolio with the, the centers or the, you know, the program-initiated part of the portfolio. And we, and, you know, I do think, I mean, this is an area where we do want to encourage, you know, a lot of innovation. The science is changing so rapidly. Um, and although the centers are designed, I think, to be very flexible and respond rapidly, you know, as things do develop, you also want, you know, you want the flexibility so that as a whole new technology comes down the pike that doesn't necessarily fit into the sort of the general subject matter of a particular center, you know, that you've got the flexibility to maybe or maybe an issue another RFA to, to focus directly on that issue, for example. Um, so we're hesitant, hesitant to tie up too much of our funds in a single program. But again, it's certainly something that, you know, can be revisited. It's just something to think about. And also the... Uh, I don't know if before I came out, I apologize, um, I was a little late, um, whether you just summarized what the themes are in the centers, because they're wildly diverse in their approach, in approaches. Yes, The yeah. kinds of things they're working on. Right, and I can go back and to... And you did. Oh, well, I already know it, so you don't have yeah. to do it for me. <laughs> yeah, no, but they are. I mean, we have, for okay. example, one of the centers is focused um, exclusively on issues relating to um, Native American, Alaska Native and, and American Indian um, sort of community attitudes um, towards genomics research, an incredibly important area because it's an underserved population that, you know, that we're, we're really, you know, trying to reach out to. Um, we have, you know, the Hopkins Center that's focused really on um, ELSI issues in genomics uh, research related to infectious disease. 
um, you know, pr prenatal um, testing as, you know, sort of um, Jeff's focus. I mean, so each of these centers um, is really has a, a, a very different and unique focus, um, and yet broad enough that they're, you know, they're able to sort of take in new issues that arise within that area of focus. Two thumbs up. Yeah, Gene, thanks for the presentation. Just two quick things. I wonder if you can comment just briefly about Sear Central and uh, that um, element of the, uh, the network organization. And then secondly, I think one of the real uh, assets of the, the network is the continued participation of centers or people who have centers who've rolled off their funding. And it would be just wonderful to be able to maintain the participation of those folks as much as possible. So I don't really have any thoughts now about how uh, the network might be able to motivate uh, uh, continued participation by those groups. Yeah, uh, two very good questions. I'll answer the second one first. Um, I think our goal and, and our plan is to try to keep the people who have been funded for these, you know, this initial over 10 years or almost 13 years now of the program, because some of these have been extended, um, to keep them involved because there's an incredible, you know, rich, I mean, these were really the pioneers in the program and we, we definitely want to have them involved and um, able to continue, you know, attending meetings or participating on, on calls. So um, that's definitely sort of a part of the plan. Exactly how that will be structured, you know, remains to be seen. Um, and then you mentioned the Sears Central, which is kind of the the, the name that we've given to the co the kind of informal coordinating center, uh, which currently is being run out of UNC. Um, and that's that's worked very well in terms of you know helping to coordinate you know monthly phone calls and most importantly to set up the the periodic meetings the face to face meetings that we have. Um, they've also coordinated um, you know uh, opportunities for trainees to travel you know from one center to another so that they can actually get some exposure to experts in working in other centers you know perhaps all the way across the country. So that's that's been another really effective. A way that we've used the coordinating center, and, and we do plan to continue that in some form. Oh, I thought it said you weren't planning to continue it in the oh. in, in the brief. It, yeah, it says no, you're not planning. No, no, not not in the no. Yeah. I yes, let me correct myself. But we'll, we'll have a coordinating function. Yeah, that it won't. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, in contrast to Gail's comment, I, I think it is important to keep. I think the one-third ratio makes sense to me um, if, if you want to continue to get unsolicited applications. And I think there will continue to be kind of new questions that come up as, as, as genetic testing gets implemented that you'd like to be able to have R01s and other things done. Mm -hmm. so let me just point out that uh, it might make sense to, if you want to revisit this issue to do it a year from now when you have the applications before you. The notion of funding three may be very compelling or it may just disappear depending on what's come in. So. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I should mention is that, you know, we are reaching out to other institutes to see if we can get funding from additional institutes and who knows, um, that may happen. I'm, I'm not holding my breath in this budget climate, but um, it could happen. And obviously if it did, that would give us greater flexibility. Okay, no need to belabor the discussion. Can I get a motion to approve the concept and a second? All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you.